Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ruben Massa and I'm the director of the Mace Cancer Center at UT Health San Antonio MD Anderson. I am very glad that you're all joining us today for an important discussion regarding the topic of breast cancer. We know that this is a very difficult illness that is a major source of, of uh, the difficulty we have in cancer in San Antonio and South Texas and really around the world. Joined today by wonderful colleagues and speakers to really take you through all of the aspects uh, relevant to breast cancer, as well as allow plenty of time for question and answers so that we can try to get to your questions regarding breast cancer. So uh, joining me today is Dr. Kate Lathrop, uh, who is one of our wonderful medical oncologists, uh, who focuses on uh, breast cancer, as well as her colleague and mine, Dr. Virginia Kaklamani, who leads our breast, breast cancer program. Dr. Federico Tozzi is a wonderful surgical oncologist who focuses on uh, the surgery of breast cancer as well as uh, other types of cancers. And Dr. Rick Cronover, one of our most experienced radiation oncologists who also focuses on breast cancer. So this really represents a multidisciplinary team Indeed, the care of breast cancer, as you'll hear, involves many medical specialties working together, from the initial radiologist who uh, might find a breast cancer on a mammogram, to the surgeon who is involved with performing a biopsy to see whether a breast cancer is present uh, and or may have a surgery to remove the breast cancer, from the medical oncologist who helps to guide care and determines the potential use or impact of either endocrine therapies or chemotherapy, and our radiation oncologists who focus on the role that radiation can have in helping us ensure a cure for breast cancer. So we're going to start with the beginning in terms of, you know, how might we be aware that somebody has breast cancer either from symptoms or from routine cancer screening. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Lathrop. Well, we're so glad that you decided to spend some time educating yourself about all these aspects of breast cancer. And just to piggyback on what Dr. Mesa pointed out, and you know, taking care of breast cancer is a team sport. Um, and so you're gonna get to hear from some of the team players, but there, there's others in the group um, that, that will kind of bring into the fold as well. So can you advance my slide? So I'm going to speak for only about 10 minutes and then we're going to pass the baton. So this is just a, an overview of some of the diagnostic way that we detect breast cancers. Mainly we're going to talk about imaging today, how we start to think or classify breast cancers. And I'm going to touch a little bit on how that's changed over you know, the last 50 years. And then some of the basic medical therapeutic approaches that we think about when we start formalizing the plan to take care of women with breast cancer. The next slide. So risk factors for breast cancer have to do with when we start talking about screening women and what women are at increased risk compared to the rest of the population for getting breast cancer. And part of a good screening test is making sure that we're applying that test to the right group of people. Because if we start screening the wrong groups of people, too often we may find that we're having tests that actually increase things called false positive or false negatives, where we actually don't find the patients that have breast cancers, or we find breast cancers that we maybe didn't even really want to know about, maybe in, a, in an older woman who has other medical problems. So the main risk factor for breast cancer is age. As women get older, our risk of developing breast cancer increases. Women who have a family history of breast cancer, and Dr. Kakamani is going to touch on some of the genetic things we look for. But even outside of some of the, the most common genetic mutations, 
Just having family members with breast or ovarian cancer can increase risk. Having a lifetime exposure to estrogen, so women who might take estrogen supplements for menopause symptoms or women who don't have as many pregnancies as other women can affect risk. Things like lifestyle, obesity, and alcohol intake can increase the risk of breast cancer. And then for a very small but important population of women who have other cancers like lymphoma that require radiation in the chest wall area, that can significantly increase their risk. So these are things we take into consideration. One of the most common questions I get from family and friends is, you know, when should I get my mammograms? How often should I get them? And these are some of the things in the background for that decision. So next slide, please. So this is the current screening recommendations based on different organizations. And all these organizations listed at the top here are well-respected, smart people who've spent a lot of time looking at good data. And they've come up with some different recommendations because not everything is completely black and white in medicine, and oftentimes there's a lot of gray. So within this, we would say our, our standard recommendation is for women less than 40 years of age and older than 25, that they should just be familiar with their breasts, meaning that they have a sense of if something changed. And that doesn't necessarily mean that women have to do very structured self breast exams every month, which used to be a recommendation. They certainly can if they feel comfortable, but not all women feel comfortable doing that. So just a general familiarity with your body and that if you feel something different or you're worried about something that you would bring that to the attention of a healthcare provider. For women who are between ages of 40 and 70, then mammograms either once a year or every other year is reasonable. And again, this is for screening. These are for women of average risk who have not had breast cancer before. And then for women greater than age 70, this is when it's reasonable for them to talk to their physician about whether they'd like to continue with breast cancer screening. And a lot of the conversations I have with my patients are, if you were to find something abnormal, what would you like to do with that information? Do you want to do more testing? Would you want a biopsy? Would you potentially want me to refer you to surgery for a surgeon? There's a lot of 70, 80, 90 year old women who are very healthy. And if they were diagnosed with a breast cancer, we would want to treat them and work that up. There's some other women that have a lot of other competing medical problems and maybe their life expectancy is fairly short at that age. And for those women, finding a breast cancer may not be very beneficial. So for women that are at increased risk in at least 35 years, and I put what we call the Gale model in here. This is something we use in clinic that's based on research where we can put in different characteristics about a woman's life or maybe some previous biopsies that they've had. And we can find out what her risk of having breast cancer in the next five years. And if she's at increased risk, then we can increase our screening. We can potentially add MRIs if, if she has dense breasts, or we can talk about preventive medicine, which is hormonal therapy, which I'll touch on briefly on my next slide. And then for women that are at a significant increased risk, and Dr. Kakamani will tell you about that with our genetic testing, then we can add on more screening with MRIs, again, hormonal therapies, and then we can even talk about risk reduction surgeries at that point. And then of course, everybody qualifies for lifestyle changes. Um, we can all exercise more and be healthier and drink less. And so those are all things that everybody can do regardless of your risk. Okay, next slide, please. So over the next five minutes, I'm just going to give a very brief overview about how we in medical oncology would approach a woman with breast cancer. So medical oncologists like myself and Dr. Kaklamani, we treat cancers with medicines. And that's not always chemotherapy, which is what I think most people assume we're talking about when, when they come to a medical oncologist. So the treatment approaches for breast cancer really depend on the biology of the breast cancer. And breast cancer is made up of different types of breast cancer. And that's here on the, the top where you have the 
Um, I don't have a maybe I don't think I have a pointer that you guys can see on my cursor, but this um, this big pink circle in the middle that says all breast cancers and then we subdivide that into three major parts and as you can see the most common thing is that these breast cancers have what's called estrogen receptors or I kind of think of them as sensors on the outside of the of the cells and this is how the breast cancer cells interact with the environment and when they are exposed to estrogen which is a hormone made um, by women in their ovaries and then after we go through menopause and the fat and the muscle tissue. When estrogen attaches or binds to that sensor, it stimulates those breast cells to grow and to divide. So we can actually use that as a way to decrease the ability of these cancer cells to grow and to divide. And so we give these medicines that actually either block that receptor or we give medicines to decrease the amount of estrogen that a woman can make in their body. And that generally depends on whether they've gone through menopause or not, and maybe some of their other medical problems that may make us choose one medicine over the other. This second group are called HER2 positive breast cancers. And this was a receptor that was first found in the 90s and then therapeutic medicines were made in the late 90s, early 2000s. And these, this is kind of the Trojan horse effect. So we use this HER2 receptor, this signal, to deliver medications. The first one was called Herceptin, which is like HER2 receptor put together as a word, so Herceptin. And it was a, a magnificent drug and decreased mortality from breast cancer in these women by more than 30% are one in three. So it was a significant leap forward. Um, I was a little too young to remember when those papers were presented, but I think Dr. Kakamani was there when, when that data was initially presented and it was pretty remarkable. And since then, more and more drugs, we've had a couple of drugs every year come out now that use this HER2 receptor as a means to deliver new medicines. And uh, Dr. Kakamani is going to go over that maybe a little bit in her metastatic um, talk. And then the last group is the triple negative group. And unfortunately, this is the group that has none of these sensors or none of these receptors. And so right now there's a big effort in breast cancer research to find the next receptor or the next signaling pathway that we can use to try to target these cancer cells because right now the only treatments we have are chemotherapy. So the first thing I do when I see a woman in clinic with breast cancer is I sit down and I think, you know, what, which one of these categories does she fit in? And then what stage is she? How big is the tumor? Are there any lymph nodes around the, the breast area that might be involved by the breast cancer? And then sometimes we give medicines before surgery and sometimes we give medicines after surgery, and sometimes we do a sandwich approach where we give some before and some after. And it really just depends on, on the type of breast cancer it is. The other thing that I put up here, um, which is below those circles, so in the, in the squares, is an example of something called an oncotype. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is I think it shows how we've, we've started to push the needle in cancer treatments away from just how big is the tumor, where is it, to what is the biology of the tumor. So what this test does for our older women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which is the majority of women that we take care of in our clinic, who have early stage breast cancer, so stage one or stage two breast cancer, we're able to, to take a sample of their tumor and look at a series of genes that are either turned on, which we call amplified, or they're turned off or suppressed. And depending on that combination of these genes, we are then able to tell women what their risk of recurrence is in the next nine years. So for example, this woman had an oncotype score of 32, which we consider high risk. It's usually between zero and 50. And her lifetime risk of having this breast cancer reoccur somewhere else in the body is about 20%. And then the next box over tells us how we can affect that if we give chemotherapy. 
So these tests tell us about the biology of a woman's individual cancer, not based on, you know, thousands of people in a study, but what her individual breast cancer is acting like, what her risk of recurrence would be, and then how we can affect that recurrence by giving different medicines. And this gives her a lot of information because all of our medicines have potential side effects and we always want there to be benefit. And this helps us know that that combination. So that's just a general overview of some of the things that we're thinking behind the scenes when we see a woman with breast cancer in the early stage of the medical oncology clinic. Wonderful. Well, that is very, very helpful information. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for Dr. Lathrop and colleagues at the end. Uh, we're saving all the questions at the end. Now, one just quick technical check. Uh, we were having just uh, some IT issues with one of our speakers. Dr. Cronover, are you able to hear us okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, we're good then. Thank you. Good, good. Well, we'll circle back to your presentation in just a moment, but we'll transition now to Dr. Kaklamani, who will be kind of taking it from there and how do we, she's tasked with a couple different topics. One, how do we then care for more advanced breast cancer, but also topics regarding genetic counseling and survivorship. Dr. Kaklamani. Thanks, Dr. Mesa. Uh, uh, Dr. Lathrop, thanks for reminding me of my age. I appreciate that. Yes, I was alive when uh, HER2 was discovered. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dr. Lathrop's presentation on early stage breast cancer le really leads uh, into my presentation on, on advanced breast cancer. And first of all, what do we mean when we say advanced breast cancer? We usually mean a breast cancer that has spread outside the breast and, and lymph nodes under the arm. So it's usually breast cancers that have gone to the bone, the, the, the brain, the liver, and the lungs. And even though the cancer is in the lung, it still originated from the breast, so we still call it breast cancer that has metastasized to the brain or the lung or the bones or the liver. So uh, the three main breast cancers that I will discuss are the hormone receptor positive breast cancers, the triple negative breast cancers, and the HER2 positive breast cancers. And we heard from Dr. Lathrop what the different definitions are, so I won't go into those. But when we talk about treatments for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which is the most common type of breast cancer, um, those are usually anti-estrogens. These types of breast cancers feed off of our body's estrogens and grow. And so our main target is to try to get rid of the estrogen that our body produces or to target the actual estrogen receptor and then kill it, suppress it, uh, antagonize it, so that it doesn't work anymore. So these antiestrogens are usually pills that we have, um, although one form is a shot that we give, and those have been shown not only to be effective in early stage breast cancer, but also to be effective in metastatic breast cancer. Now recently, recently meaning uh, within the past five years, we've had other treatments that we combine with these antiestrogens. One of the class of agents that has become very popular because it's so uh, effective are called CDK4-6 inhibitors. These drugs inhibit the, the growth of the, of the cell. So the cell is, has, to go, has to duplicate to be able to grow, and these, these agents stop the cell from duplicating. And by doing that, they kill the cancer cell. Because this pathway is actually connected with the estrogen pathway in the cell, the combination of the anti-estrogens and the oral and the CDK4-6 inhibitors has become extremely effective in treating metastatic estrogen-positive breast cancer. Now, most recently, these, these drugs are, are moving now into the early stage setting, so you will be hearing a lot more about them. Uh, we had a clinical trial at the Mays Cancer Center that, uh, that helped uh, show that, that these drugs can be effective in the early stage setting as well. Other agents that we use are called mTOR inhibitors, and those agents can help, again, in, in uh, overcoming resistance to estrogen, anti-estrogen treatments. The cancer cell is very complicated. It's also extremely smart. And so when we give it drugs, it learns how to bypass them. It learns how to grow despite the drugs that we give it. And these mTOR inhibitors are able to reverse this learning process 
so that the cancer cells can again be responsive to anti-estrogen therapies. Now, in patients that have hormone receptor positive breast cancer, when we, we give all of these anti-estrogens and eventually the cancer grows, uh, we then give chemotherapy, which is a very similar chemotherapy to what we're going to talk about in triple negative breast cancer. So triple negative breast cancer is the most difficult breast cancer to treat, not only in the early stage setting, but also in the advanced setting. And we rely mainly on chemotherapy to treat it. The chemotherapy, the definition of chemotherapy is basically drugs that target any fast growing cell in our body and kill it. So they're not specific to cancer, but because cancer is typically a fast growing drug, uh, a fast growing cell, they target cancer as well. But by doing that, they also target cells that we like, like our hair follicles, like our, our white blood cells and our red blood cells. So chemotherapy can have toxicities, but it's also extremely effective in treating triple negative breast cancer. Most recently, we had, um, we've developed immune therapy medications. Now those medications have been effective in other kinds of cancers for many years, like melanoma and kidney cancer. But uh, in the past couple of years, we found out that they can work very well in triple negative breast cancer. What these drugs do, and it's really miraculous how they work, they empower our immune system to kill the cancer cells. So they make our immune system find these cancer cells better and kill them itself. And the combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy has been shown to improve the, the survival in our triple negative breast cancer patients. And then finally, patients that have HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, we, we, we give them anti-HER2 agents. And those can be antibodies or they can be pills that we give that target this receptor called the HER2. Now, these drugs were initially um, developed in the, in the mid to late 90s. And since then, we've had a slew of drugs approved. Just in the past six months, we've had three new uh, drugs for HER2 positive breast cancer approved. So this is a very fast growing field. And, and this, even though this is the most aggressive type of breast cancer, it's also one of the best ones to have because we have such good treatment options for it. Now, the antibodies sometimes can also be uh, attached or have, have a toxin attached to them. And, and this antibody, which is called an antibody drug conjugate because it has that toxin, goes into those HER2 positive cells, the toxin is released there, and then the toxin kills the cancer cells. Next slide. So moving on to a different topic, genetic counseling, which is uh, really e extremely important to me because you know I love treating breast cancer patients. I think Dr. Lathrop and I um, uh, and all of our physicians here, Dr. Crownover, Dr. Totsi, that's what we do for a living. But I think we'd all rather be preventing breast cancer. And this is what genetic counseling can help us do. 20 to 25% of breast cancers are what we call hereditary or familial. That means that they have some genetic component. The hereditary breast cancers are typically the ones that we know what the genetic component is. We know the gene involved. And the familial is where we can see a family pattern. The mom had breast cancer, the grandmother had breast cancer, and now maybe the daughter has breast cancer. But we do a genetic test and we can't necessarily find a gene involved, but we know that there's something hiding there. Several genes can, can cause breast cancer. And the way they cause breast cancer is they have changes on them that are called mutations. And these mutations uh, make those genes not work well and therefore make our, pa the, our patients predisposed to developing breast cancer. The most common genes that we know for breast cancer are called BRCA1 and BRCA2. And these genes can cause bre breast cancer by, by not allowing the cell, the DNA of the cell to, to to repair itself. Now, if a patient has changes in those genes, mutations in those BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, they can have up to an 80% chance of having breast cancer. They can have up to a 50% chance of, of developing ovarian cancer. And you guys may have heard of these genes because uh, several celebrities have tested positive, such as Angelina Jolie. So they've been in the news recently as far as, uh, as, as understanding what we should be doing. So something that I always tell people is they need to be aware of their family history. 
and they need to share that with their physician. They need to know that their grandmother had breast cancer at what age or, or any other cancer. This, this family history is extremely important because this is where everything starts from. Once we know that there's a suggestion of some familial pattern to the cancer, then we can, we can start our genetic counseling where we look at the family history. We, we try to see what genetic changes may be very likely for the patient to have. And then we order testing for that patient and for the family sometimes so that we can identify those genes and then help prevent cancers in, in that family. So first of all, we start with our family history. And then what we do is we calculate what the risk is for an individual to, de to develop certain kinds of cancers, not just breast cancer. Those cancer risk models are very important because if a woman has a high risk of developing breast cancer, she may be eligible for MRI screening. So instead of just having a mammogram every year, she may also need an MRI. And this may help detect the breast cancer earlier. And the earliest we detect it, the better the chance of curing this breast cancer. And then finally, we discuss what the implications are of the genetic testing that we are going to order. What if a woman tests positive for a specific gene mutation? What does that mean for her? What does it mean for her family? What if she tests negative? What if we find changes that are called variants, which are really benign, they don't really cause anything, but they are changes in that gene? What does that mean? So we have to educate our patients so that when they get the testing results, they know what they mean. So the results, as I mentioned, can be one of three things. We can have a change in the gene that is associated with breast cancer. This is called the deleterious change. And when we find that, then that's where we know that this patient has a high risk for a specific kind of cancer. And this is our chance to try to prevent it. For breast cancer, one of the ways to prevent it is going to, do, to be by doing a bilateral mastectomy. And we, we only reserve this for very high risk patients, but definitely something that can be beneficial for the right patient. If a patient has a negative test, that means that we did not find a change in their DNA that may be associated with cancer. And therefore, if that patient already has cancer, we just don't know why, whether they, why they got it and we, it's probably not related to genes. And then the variant that I mentioned before, that's basically um, a change in the DNA that does not necessarily have to do with their cancer. It's just a change that is a, a normal change. And we have to explain to the patient that that change does not really mean anything for them. Next slide. And then finally, moving on to survivorship, which is really one of the very important parts of our treatment, because luckily most of our patients survive and they um, may die of other things, but not of breast cancer. So our survivorship care is extremely important. So how do we follow our patients? We follow our patients initially by trying to make sure that if there are any signs of, of recurrence of their breast cancer, of the breast cancer coming back, that we find that early. And that's where we do mammograms. We may need to do ultrasounds. And we also do our physical exams and we ask patients how they're feeling. This is where we can identify a breast cancer early when it's come back. But we also have to understand that the treatments that we have given our patients can have both short-term and long-term side effects. For example, the anti-estrogens that we discussed can cause menopausal symptoms. They can cause hot flashes, they can cause mood swings. And those are things that women may live with for the five or 10 years that they're on these medications. And therefore very important for us to discuss with our patients how to treat them. Some other medications that are again anti-estrogen can cause osteoporosis and osteoporosis can lead to bone fractures. So we try to prevent osteoporosis by giving medications that can strengthen the bones. Also, if we put a patient into menopause in her 30s or 40s, we may cause premature heart disease. Some medications that we give, give such as the anti-HER2 antibodies can also cause heart disease. So extremely important for us to be able to follow patients to, to explain to them what to look for. And, and so that if they do have symptoms of heart disease, we identify those early and we send them to a specialist. And then finally, secondary cancers. Our chemotherapy can increase the risk of certain kinds of leukemia. Radiation, as Dr. Crownover may mention later, can increase the risk of a specific kind of sarcoma. So those are things that we need to be aware of 
we need our patients to be aware of so that if they get any of these symptoms, they don't ignore them, they seek attention, and we try to solve that issue as soon as we can. So I'm going to finish with that, and I appreciate your attention. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sakramani. And uh, we'll move on to the next topic. So uh, now Dr. Federico Tozzi is going to discuss for us really what is involved with the surgical care of the breast cancer patient. Dr. Totsi. Uh, good, good, good afternoon to everyone. I want to thank you for this opportunity to um, lay out my uh, role of the treatment of breast cancer uh, with this multidisciplinary team because truly um, the care of breast cancer here, uh, as any other cancer, comes as a summary of the effort of a multiple specialties, as we heard from medical oncology, now surgical oncology, and thereafter will be my colleague, Dr. Cranover in radiation oncology. Uh, the goal, yes, is to, uh, to identify the best treatment for uh, breast cancer, uh, but that comes with educating uh, the patients and, the, um, and their families and friends to uh, what this entails. And uh, when it comes to surgery, um, allow the patient uh, to uh, make a decision um, in regards what is the best um, surgical approach and entitle them to make the decision that they feel the most comfortable in light of the fact that the results will be at last for the uh, for the rest of their life. Um, uh, I'd like to um, to review these uh, by um, Show, by sharing with you a few of the uh, surgical uh, anatomy of the of the breast, uh, which is um, composed of the um, glandular um, glandular tissue um, uh, between the lobules and the duct. The lobules produce milk at the time of uh, lactation, and then they drain through the duct, and then the uh, lactiferous duct will concentrate at the level of the nipple and the areola. The nipple areola being the uh, pigmented area of the breast. And uh, surprisingly, the breast tissue per se, the gland, represents the uh, mean, this smallest part of the, of the volume of the breast. The majority of the volume is given by the adipose tissue, the ligaments that uh, holds the breast uh, to, the, to, the, to the chest wall and give the shape of the breast. And this suggests that um, the breast tissue is um, spread throughout the volume of the, of the breast that we appreciate on, exam, on a physical exam. But there are some landmarks that are highlighted here in the figure in the picture um, that allowed us to, um, to understand what the surgical uh, options are um, about. Uh, superior to the breast tissue can extend to the clavicle, which is the collarbone. Inferiorly, uh, here the inframammary fold uh, below the breast, and laterally to the axilla, which is very this district of the body, very important to the care uh, to the treatment of breast cancer, where not only some of the breast tissue extends from ant uh, the anterior part, but also where um, the regional lymph nodes that drain the um, lymphatic tissue and uh, therefore the uh, cancer cells can be uh, localized where these lymph nodes represent the guardian for the uh, cancer um, uh, that is attempting to spread to the rest of the body. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the uh, treatment of breast cancer from the surgical standpoint is simplified by two approaches, the mastectomy and the lumpectomy. Uh, the role of surgery in the treatment of breast cancer has a long, long history that goes back to the um, ancient civilizations, being the only um, being the only treatment available, and this was indeed um, kind of unified uh, in the recent in the modern medicine. Uh, Johns Hopkins with uh, Dr. Halstead. Next slide. Where in 1894, he defined as modified radical mastectomy as the only treatment for breast cancer. The picture here in the bottom represents how drastic this surgical approach 
uh, was that it included not only the breast, but also the surrounding tissue to include the axilla with the lymph nodes, the lymph nodes that sits above the clavicle, the collarbone, and immediately towards the sternum, and also the pectoralis major, resulting in a very drastic um, results in terms of uh, the cosmesis and the, and the uh, functionality of the patient. This um, approach would held for um, over 100 years um, after Halstead. And the principle of this approach was that the cancer has um, the, uh, uh, the, has the ability to diff, uh, diffuse through uh, tissues um, and therefore a radical approach will improve the survival. This approach was then um, um, placed into question um, by another surgeon, which was Bernard Fischer, who was uh, the, um, the leader of the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project which simply was a group of surgeons and other physicians that questioned this radical approach. And this came at a time um, where we did have evidence that chemotherapy had a, a significant role to prolong the life of patients and to decrease the recurrence. And nonetheless, the, the effect of radiation on breast cancer was demonstrated to destroy cancer cells. So with, with lumpectomy, meaning a limited surgery, this, um, the, the mastectomy became less of, a, uh, of and the only option for uh, the treatment of breast, uh, of breast cancer. Uh, while these, um, the mastectomy um, has been <clears throat> represented here in the picture as, you know, um, a, um, a, pr a proud step of women and uh, of patients in general, who um, have been going across uh, this um, these disease, the lumpectomy has been um, appreciated, it has an enormous appreciation by, by the patients that ultimately maintain uh, most of the cosmesis uh, of, of the breast. Next slide. When we, ref when we refer to lumpectomy here in the picture on the, on the left, um, the incision is a much smaller incision. It's a minimal approach. Incision that can be, be um, um, can be done at the level of the areola along the border, and that incision eventually, in a matter of years, uh, almost disappears, or in the hidden part of the breast, just by the inframammary fold or towards the axilla. Next slide. The second um, component of the uh, surgery is the interrogation of lymph nodes or the removal of the lymph nodes within the axilla. The first procedure, sentinel lymph node biopsy, has a, ro has a role into um, staging the cancer to achieve a pathological final staging and to further address the treatments. This technique uh, was developed in the last 20 years. Um, is based on the, the principle that the, the uh, fluid and the cells within the breast slowly migrate towards the lymph nodes. And by using this principle, we use um, a radioactive substance or dye that is injected at the level of the tumor or the nipple and in a matter of an hour, migrates towards the first lymph nodes that will receive the cancer cells eventually, and those are removed at the time of the surgery when the breast cancer is removed. Another approach, when we do have evidence that are lymph nodes involved at the time of the diagnosis, is to remove the lymph nodes in total. And this approach is to decrease the chance of recurrence at the level of the axilla. When the sentinel node biopsy will remove two to four lymph nodes, in the axillary node section with a larger incision, we remove 15 to 30 nodes. That the goal is to remove all the, pres all, all the nodes present within the axilla. The difference between the two surgeries uh, goes towards not only the prognosis, but also towards the possible um, complication of the, um, of the surgery being the axillary node section more morbid as a procedure. Next slide. Um, 
after the surgery um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the breast tissue removed, as well as the sentinel, as well as the nodes, are under the uh, processing of the, of the um, breast pathologist. Uh, today, you, uh, you had the, the chance to ask us questions um, as medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and um, um, surgical oncologists. But as uh, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned, behind the scenes, there's a, even a more extended um, um, pool of physicians and, spe and, and a specialized physician to allow us to identify what the best treatment is. When it comes to the, the uh, surgical specimens, the um, breast pathologist identified the tumor, verified the size of the tumor, which is part of the staging, the tumor histology, confirming the histology of the tumor that was identified during the biopsy done prior to surgery, that is the case. Nonetheless, the margin status to verify the quality of the surgery, if the, all the margins are negative, in other words, when we remove the tumor, either in a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, the goal is to remove the tumor with a free layer of tissue around the tumor to call negative margins. And nonetheless, the nodal status. All these components are part of the staging to direct the uh, next step in therapy. Next slide. The role of the surgeons remains uh, at the surgical oncology to extirpate the tumor and identify the best treatment to make let, uh, to reduce the chance for the for the tumor to uh, come back on the same breast, uh, but also to assist the patient to um, to identify the best um, cosmetic solution, either to um, give back a breast similar to the natural breast, or to um, um, to use techniques within the uh, lumpectomy to reshape the breast to an, um, a more cosmetic and um, to a more cosmetic um, aspect. Um, here, another historic point I want to make for you. In 1887, Vernoil in France was the first physician who um, experimented to um, rearrange tissues as a flap procedure, which is here in the picture above, where part of the um, uh, part of the tissue from the uh, abdominal wall to include the skin, the fat, and the muscle was transferred to the breast to reshape the volume of the breast. Other techniques to include implants are also, uh, I also um, one of the solutions that today we uh, use to, um, to give uh, a the back a natural breast. Um, we work in tandem in, a, in team with the plastic surgeons uh, that are speci specialized in uh, these kind of procedures. And uh, a consultation with the plastic surgeons many times takes place uh, prior to uh, the surgery because, again, uh, the goal is to educate to um, the patient, to educate to um, entitle the patient to make the best decision in regards to uh, the treatment of the breast cancer and how the cosmesis will be uh, um, the cosmetic result and how it's going to affect their life. Um, and with this, uh, I'm going to uh, hand the, uh, the presentation to uh, Dr. Cronover. Wonderful. Well, last but, but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Cronover will discuss the role of radiation in the care of uh, the patient with breast cancer, and then we'll get to some of the pre-submitted questions as well as any that you wish to submit online. Dr. Cronover. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation to, to talk today. And people that have heard me speak about things before know that I like to put up lots of slides. So I've kind of compacted multiple slides onto one here. And so what you see here on the left is a patient who was being treated with tangent field radiation back in the 90s, we'll say, up until about 2000. That's pretty much what it would have looked like. You can see the changes in the skin toward the end of treatment that are showing the, the outlines of the fields. And you'll notice a couple of things. You'll notice that they're pretty generous up into the 
axilla because we're picking up low level nodes with these fields you'll notice there's a pretty significant skin reaction and not a lot of skin breakdown for this particular patient. And if you look at the picture that's on the right, which is a, a cross section through a patient receiving tangent fields, you'll see that the blue contour inside the chest, right underneath the area where the radiation fields are, that represents where the heart would have been in 2000 and shows that the heart is sneaking into the back of the field, which can have some effects on it, we'll talk about. And so the trend, the evolution of radiation has been in a number of directions, and one of the most significant has been decreasing morbidity or decreasing problematic side effects from the treatment. So one thing that's happened is it was gradually recognized that radiation was accelerating after atherosclerosis for our left-sided breast tumors where the heart was sitting right under the field. So it was leading to a small excess in cardiac events, in heart attacks, in needing catheterizations and, and surgeries. And so we've developed techniques like the one that's depicted in this right-hand picture where we deliver the radiation at a time when the heart's not in the field. That's what the pink outline represents. This is a patient who's been simulated or the pictures were taken for treatment planning when they had taken a deep breath hold and they're holding their breath, which moves the heart away from the fields. And we think this will significantly decrease effects on the heart in the future. But there are other things that have improved over the years too. When I started my career, so you know, back in the, the 90s, I guess I was around when Perceptin was discovered too, probably before that. But when I was starting my career, we would have expected a significant rate of swelling in the arm lymphedema chronically. It ran almost as high as one in three for patients that were treated at that time. And the reason was there was a very significant surgical dissection that was performed and then radiation to the same area and that combination led to significant lymphedema where fluids couldn't effectively get out of the arm very very commonly and the surgeons have really kind of led the changes in this where they do very selective nodal dissection like dr totsi was talking about but also radiation oncologists used to routinely treat directly through the axilla from the front and the back and give very high doses to those same areas and that scarred the lymphatics. We don't do that very often. At this point, they're very specific and rare indications for it. And so we've seen the rate of significant lymphedema drop down to a few percent from 30 percent not that long ago. And another trend has been to do even less surgery and use radiation instead to cover areas that might be microscopically involved. And we've got studies that show that the radiation works as well as the surgery, as the surgical dissection for many patients, but it has much less morbidity. It's, it's much easier on the patient. Another thing that's not on the slide is with the older techniques, we saw chronic pain or weakness in the arm that would develop after treatment that could be permanent in about one in 400 patients. And we expect to see very little of that in patients who are treated now and in recent years moving forward. The reason for that is if you look at the right picture here, you see the cross section from the CAT scan that was done for treatment planning, and we can see the anatomy. We can see where the vessels are. We can see where the nerves are. We can see where the target in the breast is. Prior to about 2000, most breast treatments were given using just anatomic landmarks. And so we would take basically an x-ray and look for those landmarks and set up the field. We knew that these structures that I just mentioned were within the fields, but we didn't know exactly where they were. Now we can see them. We can make sure the dose is very even through those areas that we don't have hot and cold spots. Also, there's been a reduction. I know. Dr. Kaklamani mentioned sarcomas as a late effect of radiation. That would be one of the more common types of tumors caused rarely by radiation. The risk for most women is about one in, in a thousand. 
But we know that the risk of those sarcomas came from hot spots in the radiation field. So it's a dose dependent phenomenon. And now that we've been able to see what we're doing, have better calculations that can smooth those doses out, we don't really expect to see as much of that in the future. It won't eliminate it, but it will reduce it. The other thing that has happened, there's been a trend toward more convenient schedules. So radiation treatments were typically given to the breast over five to seven weeks, with treatments being Monday through Friday, five days a week. We have a couple of studies, actually three studies now, that show us that shorter schedules that are about three weeks long are equivalent for most women in terms of tumor control. And interestingly, and I'm going to kind of compress some of what I was going to say, interestingly, it turns out that the cosmetic outcomes are better when we use those shorter schedules, which is really fascinating because the reason for the longer schedules initially was because we thought if we treated too fast that we would have a lot of scarring and a lot of changes in the tissues. Turns out to be exactly the opposite of that. Another thing that's happened is the pendulum of what treatment is used in a particular situation treating cancer tends to change based on developments in a particular field. So sometimes the pendulum will swing toward surgery, sometimes it will swing toward radiation for a given patient situation. And everything that I've been talking about so far has led to an interesting thing. And that's that as we've gotten technically better and the side effects of radiation have decreased, we've found that we can offer more generous nodal radiation treatments to a larger group of patients. So it's kind of lowered the threshold for using that type of treatment. And we actually use what's called comprehensive nodal radiation much more commonly because we've got studies that show that there's a, perhaps a small survival benefit to the radiation, which we hadn't seen in the initial studies that were done. Ruben, I guess you forward the slides. Is that the way that works? That's correct. There we go. Thank, thank you. And then just briefly, I wanted to mention that we use radiation as part of definitive or curative treatment. We also use radiation in the metastatic setting to reduce symptoms and very effectively try and anticipate what symptoms will be and prevent them. So here on the left, you have a patient with a head frame bolted to the skull so that we could do radio surgery back in the year 2000. Now we've evolved where most of these procedures are done with a plastic mask that holds the head very still. So it's a tight, uncomfortable mask, but it isn't something that has to be bolted on by a neurosurgeon and the patient has to wear it all day. What this has led to is a couple of things. It means that the patients are more comfortable. It means that the planning doesn't have to be done in a rush on the day the patient's wearing the frame, which was always a little bit of a concern. Now we can make the mask, do the scan, do the planning, bring the patient back when the plan is ready and give the treatment. The picture on the right is depicting the fact that we can now, because we have a lot of robotics in our, our equipment, we can now treat multiple lesions simultaneously. So if we were treating the way we did in 2000, we would never have offered radio surgery to a patient with that many lesions because it would have taken a day and a half to treat them and they would have had to wear the frame all that time and there just was very little yield or gain to that. But now we can have, again, a lower threshold of offering this kind of treatment because we can treat all of those at one at once. And so the treatment takes about 45 minutes rather than 45 minutes times the number of lesions that we're treating. Same techniques been moved into the body for stereotactic body radiotherapy. We use it for treating lung lesions, liver lesions, spinal lesions, and others. And I just want to very briefly mention that one of the exciting new areas is the way we coordinate these treatments with systemic therapy. And I'll give you a couple of examples. There are immunotherapy approaches now where it's being investigated whether using radiation to basically blast one of these lesions release a lot of the cellular components or antigens into the body might make the treatment more effective elsewhere in the body, so not at the site we treated with radiation. The other is that if a medical oncologist, if Dr. Lathrop or Dr. Kaklamani are treating a patient, they may have a few regimens, a few different kinds of drugs that will be effective, and they kind of use one 
until that isn't controlling tumor anymore. And then they change to another one. And when that's not controlling tumor anymore, they change to another one. And eventually you, you get to where you're, you're kind of down the road with that. Something that's being done with radio surgery now is if someone has, say, seven or eight lesions, and the drugs that are being given are controlling all but one or two of them, if we treat the one or two that are progressing, because it's probably working for the other lesions, then perhaps they can stay with that regimen longer and not progress through the different types of treatments that they have as quickly. And there, I think I'll stop because we're getting close to the hard stop on time. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, these have been really spectacular uh, talks and uh, really have given us a tremendous sense of where we stand in terms of caring for the patient with breast cancer. Now, we've had many questions that have come in, and unfortunately, we've had so much good information to go through that we're at the end of, of our time. So what uh, I suggest that we do is we will be holding an additional session for really a panel discussion focusing solely on questions both sent in as well as live questions and we're going to arrange that in uh, at the beginning of october during a breast cancer awareness month so we're going to create a, a whole no additional hour to really be have a discussion between our wonderful experts of doctors Lathrop, kaklamani totsi and crownover and we will put all of today's session uh, out on our website so that people are able to uh, listen to this in detail as well as come up with additional questions that they may uh, wish to put forward for our panel. So let me thank uh, all of them as well as our wonderful staff that have put this uh, together for us. We truly hope that this has been helpful and we look forward to in the future being able to continue to have virtual type educational offerings like this and of course live events once it is safe to do so. Uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Mace Cancer Center at UT Health San Antonio, we wish you all well and to continued safety. Thank you.